the family members and loved ones come together to celebrate the holidays together. And then, uh, certainly this happens. It's, it's very tragic. The Christmas capital of the state of Texas, guess where it is? How about right here in our own backyard? Since 2009, the city of Grapevine has held that title. From the decorations on each storefront along its historic Main Street to its endless list of holiday events and programs. There's over 1,500 activities from the start November 22nd all the way to January 10th. The city of Grapevine takes Christmas to a whole new level. To be the Christmas capital of Texas, you can't buy it out of a catalog and have the same thing the next city has or the next state or county. On December 25th, people around the world gather together to enjoy Christmas Day. They look forward to the good food, the gift givings and the Christmas films. Grapevine, Texas is a suburban middle class town covering 16 square miles and home to roughly 50,000 people. It's safe to say that folks in Grapevine love Christmas. It was even named the Christmas capital of Texas. Christmas Day, 2011. It was quiet and calm in Grapevine. People were spending time with their families and everything seemed normal. That was until 11.34 a.m. Grapevine 911, where is your emergency? Hello, Grapevine 911. You need help? Are you sick? What was that? Do you need an ambulance or police? Hello? One moment. I'm just getting heavy breathing on the phone and I need to come to talk to you, so please send me The caller was breathing heavily and it was not clear what was being said or what the situation was. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. After roughly 20 seconds, the line went dead and the caller was no longer responding. The call had come from the landline of a local apartment, so police and firefighters were quickly dispatched to investigate what, if anything, was going on. Just three minutes later, the police arrived at the two-story unit of the Lincoln Vineyard Apartments, part of the 2500 block on Hall Johnson Road. The apartment the call had come from was located at the back of the complex and overlooked the fields of Colleville Heritage High School. Many people had left to spend time with families and loved ones, so loads of the apartments were empty. When they arrived at the apartment, the front door had been locked from the inside. They knocked on the door, but the silence was deafening. Nobody was answering or coming to the door. Officers looked through the window and came across a gruesome scene. There were seven bodies, some on the sofa, some lying on the floor. Knowing that they could not waste any time, they kicked the door in and gained entry to the apartment. It was in the living room they found the bodies. There were three males, two adults and a teen, and four females, two older and two younger. They had all been shot to death. Some of them had defensive wounds, indicating that they had attempted to shield themselves from the bullets, it appeared that they had just finished opening their Christmas presents when the massacre took place. The two adult males each had a gun in their right hand. None of the neighbours reported hearing any gunshots, but there were not many people around in the apartments at that time. As the police found out across the complex and crime scene examinations got underway, one thing stood out. A sport utility vehicle was parked outside the apartment. After running checks, they found that it was registered to a man who lived two miles away, in the suburb of Colleyville. News was quickly spreading about the Christmas Day massacre, but they needed to identify the victims before any information could be released, as well as inform the next of kin. The police thought they knew who the victims were, but they had to be sure. Getting confirmation would take longer than they wanted, as the state driver's licensed fingerprint database wasn't available due to it being the holidays. It's the, uh, probably the worst investigation that we've had to, you know, investigate in, uh, you know, many years. Uh, this is something that's very tragic and, uh, 
you know, regardless of what day of the year it happens on, it's it's, it's something that's very uh, unfortunate. But uh, it's certainly amplified, uh, given the fact that it is Christmas today. Uh, I've been with this police department for 12 years, and uh, this is probably the most tragic thing that we've, you know, I've certainly been involved with. Uh, and I think, you know, I can speak safely for the rest of the police department. I don't think any uh, members of the police department has encountered something like this on Christmas Day. Grapevine police say someone inside the family's apartment called 911 around 11.30 Sunday morning, but the line stayed silent. Officers soon arrived and broke down the door. It appears that the victims are all in one central location, living area, kitchen area. The four women and three men, ranging from their late teens to early 60s, had been shot with a pistol. The bodies were removed from the house and taken away to have autopsies carried out. After this, the names of the victims were eventually released. They were all part of the same family. Sergeant Robert Eberling explained that there had been two weapons, one being a Glock 23 40 caliber pistol with a 10 round clip and the other being a Smith & Wesson 915 model 9mm pistol with a 15 round magazine. This was registered to the owner of the vehicle parked outside. The weapon had been purchased in 1996. Uh, it's still early in this investigation, obviously, though this did play out some almost 24 hours ago. No, there is no known motive, at least as one that police are telling us about. There is also no outward sign of the horrible tragedy that unplayed right through this sliding glass and door uh, frame here of this apartment complex. Here is what we do know at this point. No one heard any of the gunshots that were fired inside of this home. Someone from inside of the home called 911 around 1130 yesterday morning, but that person did not speak into the phone. An operator then sent police, Grapevine, Texas police, here to this scene to go and investigate, and they found the scene that we've been talking about. Their bodies were found in what was otherwise the evidence of a normal Christmas morning. There were Christmas presents that had been unwrapped, and there was paper strewn about the room, but obviously, no doubt, a very right. sad situation in this town on Christmas morning, which calls itself the Christmas capital of Texas. As far as what neighbors are saying, I mean, I can show you a bit here, Richard. This is a uh, sort of tight knit, uh, very packed together apartment complex. Mm. We have spoken to several neighbors who are waking up this day after Christmas morning. They're all asking us what happened. They're speaking about a tragedy, something like this. Uh, they would not otherwise expect. On the other side of this apartment complex, there is a brown fence and beyond that is a high school here, Colleyville Heritage High School, which is noted to be one of the best high schools in the entire North Texas mm. region. People move here because this is a safe community. Uh, and they're saying, obviously, they have to question that given what happened yesterday. The 26th of December, the owner of a local spa became concerned when one of her employees of four years had failed to turn up for work. She tried calling her employee, but got no answer. For somebody who's always early to work and who never misses a day of work, we expected the worst, she said. Residents were terrified. This was the worst gun violence that the community had ever seen and the police needed to deal with their fears. Sergeant Ebeling said we are pretty confident that the shooter is among the deceased victims inside the apartment. We are not actively looking for a shooter that we believe is at large. As they began to piece together what they knew, the truth about who these people were and what had happened would eventually come out. Colleyville, Texas a wealthy suburb of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just a few miles away from Grapevine, home to the Yazdampana family. Parents, 56-year-old Aziz and 55-year-old Nasreen, had both been born in Iran. They married in 1987 and moved to the United States, where they later welcomed two children, Nona, who was 19, and her younger brother, Ali. Nasreen had worked in a salon doing manicures and would often talk about her family with people. Family was everything to Nasreen. She was close to her sister Zore, and together they were described as two of the nicest people you could meet. Zore was married to a man called Mohammed Hussein Zore, who was also known as Hussein, and he was very well known amongst the Iranian American community. He owned a large ranch in Dallas, and the family was incredibly close. The Yazdan Panas lived in a 3,000 square foot property in Colleyville, and on the surface, things appeared to be fine. Neighbours would see the family having yard sales, and Aziz appeared to be very active in his children's lives. 
He volunteered as a debate coach at Nona's High School. One neighbour said, he was, from everything we saw, actively engaged with his children. He was described as outgoing and would say hello to people if he passed them in the streets. But neighbours did note that he seemed to be very protective of his children. Nona and Ali were both doing well, so their parents had plenty to be proud of. Nona graduated from Colleyville Heritage High School and was a student at a local community college. She had big dreams of moving to the West Coast and going to school in California, with hopes of one day becoming a lawyer. One of Nona's friends said that she had implied all was not well within her family and that things were becoming tougher for them, but she divulged no further information. Her friend said that she was aware that Aziz was, in her words, really strict with his children and would take Nona's phone and refuse to give it back. She added that Nasreen was far more understanding than Aziz was. Nasreen's brother Ali said he had been supporting the family financially as Aziz had not been in employment for a number of years having previously worked in the mortgage and real estate business. His financial problems had been going on for years. In 1996, he was placed on probation for three years after he entered a plea of guilty to one count of subscribing to a false income tax return. He was issued with a fine of $1,000 and ordered to pay $30,119 in restitution to the Department of Justice. Just three years later, Aziz and Nasreen jointly filed for bankruptcy. The case was discharged a few months later. The financial problems continued to get worse. In August 2010, Nasreen had filed for bankruptcy. She told her lawyer that she hoped doing this would mean they would be able to keep and stay in their family home, but the house was foreclosed on. Aziz initially attended the meetings with Nasreen, but this would soon change. During the proceedings, she separated from her husband and moved with their two children out of the family home to an apartment in Grapevine two miles away. Nasreen's brother had paid for the apartment, as, due to the house being foreclosed on, they were living without electricity or water. Nasreen was the only one bringing money into the house. Nona opened up to one of her friends and said she felt like her family was falling apart. The bankruptcy Nasreen had filed for was later dismissed as she had not made the planned payments, according to her lawyer, George Barnes. He wrote in his notes that Nasreen had said to him, please don't talk to husband at all. Aziz had listed his employment as being self-employed, even though he was out of work and bringing no money in at all. Aziz allegedly sold the family's furniture and rugs to pay for sex workers. The separation and financial difficulties had been incredibly hard on Nasreen. She had a state cosmetology licence, but Aziz had forbidden her from working. After he became unemployed and the family's finances took a hit, she had worked two jobs at different spas to try and keep the money coming in. After they separated, a family friend said that Nasreen had done everything she could to remain on good terms with Aziz. They said, with the help of her sister, she decided to just buy the basic things for her apartment. She was a very quiet, very super kind lady. She was a peacemaker. She didn't want anything to happen to her kids, her family. She was a really wonderful mom and always protecting her kids. After Nasreen moved out, Aziz stayed in the family home and neighbours would often see him working in the yard. One neighbour said he wasn't even aware that Aziz's wife and children had left for home. Although separated, they did appear to be on good terms, and Aziz also had a key to the new apartment, and would occasionally swing by to see his children. As the year began to come to a close, it was soon time for what the people of Grapevine loved most, Christmas. On Christmas Eve, the extended family had all gathered at Mohammed's ranch to enjoy a large Christmas party and spend some much-needed time together. One of those in attendance was 22-year-old Sara, Zoray and Mohammed's daughter, who attended the University of Texas at Arlington as a pre-med student and was also a member of the Tri-Delta sorority. Dozens of people were there and the celebrations carried on late into the night. Aziz had not been invited. The following day, Christmas. Nasreen and her children were at the apartment in Grapevine. That morning, Aziz had set off to the apartment in his sport utility vehicle, dressed as Santa Claus. He parked up outside. Shortly after he arrived, Nasreen's sister, brother-in-law and niece came to the apartment too. Just before 11am, Sarah sent a text message to her friend which said, So we're here. We just got here and my uncle is here too. Dressed as Santa. Awesome. She was, of course, referring to Aziz. 
Just 15 minutes later, she sent another message. Now he wants to be all fatherly and win father of the year. Within a few minutes, after opening their gifts, Aziz revealed he had brought two guns with him. He opened fire and, in terrifyingly quick succession, killed six members of his family. Ali, Nona, Zore and Sara had multiple gunshot wounds and had been shot several times in the head. Mohammed had shots to his chest, stomach and head. Nasreen had one shot to the head. At 11.34, less than 20 minutes after Sara had sent that text message, the 911 call was made. Grapevine 911, where is your emergency? Hello, Grapevine 911. You need help? Are you sick? What was that? Do you need an ambulance or police? Hello? Although what was said on the call was not clear to the dispatcher at the time, the police decided to run it through a different software to see if the audio could be enhanced and if any more information about what had transpired could be found in the call. After doing this, it was determined that someone said, help, help, and then the caller said, I'm shooting people. They came to the conclusion that Aziz had made the call to emergency services. Grapevine 911, where is your emergency? Hello, Grapevine 911. You need help? Are you sick? What was that? He had then attempted to stage the scene and point the finger at Muhammad. He put the Smith & Wesson into the right hand of his brother-in-law, trying to make it appear as though he was a shooter as well. Mohammed had four gunshot wounds to his body that had been fired from both the gun in his hand and the one Aziz was holding. This was not something he could have done himself. After wiping out his family and calling the police, Aziz turned the gun on himself. Yet more revealing information. Very hard to stomach this morning as we listen to Grapevine Police give us the latest update. They are now telling us that this gunman dressed as Santa Claus was definitely an invited guest. Welcome at this Christmas celebration that no one knew he had arrived with two handguns he intended to use. And when he did, police say, he caught his victims totally by surprise. We await more information, but what we already do know is that this family involved Involved, definitely had some financial problems. We know that mom and Depp had separated back in March and that dad was still living in the Colleyville home that the bank had foreclosed on last year. Seven family members shot and killed on Christmas Day. Just to know that like the entire family was murdered is pretty awful. It's certainly the worst signal shooting that we've had with this many victims. Neighbors broke away from their holiday gatherings and watched as police searched the apartment for clues. They say the family kept to themselves and are stunned by the timing. It's just crazy, you know, unexpected, especially on Christmas Day, and family members most of all. With so many unanswered questions, investigators are trying to determine why the gunman massacred his own family on what should have been a day of joy. Mayor Tate Williams expressed his shock at what had happened, calling it a terrible tragedy, adding, the fact it happened on Christmas makes it even more tragic. Sergeant Eberling, who had been working on the case, echoed these sentiments. This is the worst homicide we've ever had. These have been the first murders in Grapevine since 2010. People could not believe that something this violent had happened on their doorstep. Funeral arrangements were made, and friends, family and loved ones flew into Texas from across the country and abroad. The six victims were later buried in a private service. As police continued with their investigations, they went to the home in Colleyville that had been foreclosed on, hoping that they would be able to find more. They wondered if Aziz's computer would reveal some information or a possible motive, but it emerged that the electricity for the property had been turned off, so the computer had not been used. They remained stumped as to what could have possibly led to him committing such a violent attack. As they talked to friends and family, they began to piece together the picture of a man who was deeply unhappy that his wife appeared to be doing better without him, whilst he was unemployed and remained in the home he was about to lose. 
The bank was due to remove him from the house as early as March the following year, and the prospect of becoming homeless, coupled with his wife thriving and doing well, could have possibly been a motive. But, as he is no longer here to account for his actions, his exact thoughts will never be known. Lieutenant Todd Deering said, You can speculate about his bankruptcy. You can speculate about his family relationships. You can speculate about a bunch of different things. But we just don't know right now. Everybody who may have known what the motive was or what set everything off is now deceased. Sergeant Eberling added, We really don't have a clear idea of why he did this. Sometimes, there's not a really good explanation for irrational behaviour. One of the friends of the family said it was her belief that the murders had been motivated by Aziz's anger that his wife was doing good on her own. The shootings in Grapevine on Christmas Day not only stunned the community and shocked the police department in its senselessness and brutality, it left a family shattered. For Nona, Ali and Sara, their lives had really only just begun. The opportunities and possibilities for them were endless and who knows what amazing things they could have gone on to accomplish. For Zore and Mohammed, they were two people who meant so much to their local community, as well as their family. Their lives being ended was an incalculable loss to those who loved them. And for Nasreen, who was finally starting to thrive and enjoy this fresh start on her own, the fact that her life was taken by the man who had promised to love and protect her only adds to the devastation caused by this senseless act of violence. For those of you that like to listen on the go, we now have our episodes in podcast form, and you can now find this via the link in our description box, or by searching Truly Criminal Podcast on your podcasting platforms.